name is Kautha Rahmani, and I'm from San Diego, California. And I'm adopted. I've always knew that I was adopted. My parents always told me from the time I was young. And I always knew that I was Iranian. Um, my parents were American, my, my uh, adopted parents. They're from Boston, both of them. They're white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. My biological mother is, was American, and my biological father was Iranian. And I always knew that. But I didn't really know anything about Iran or what Iranian was. It was just something that was a fact of life, a fact about me. And then um, as time went on, one day my mom came to me and said, come, come quick, look at the TV. And I look at the TV and right there before my eyes, Islamic revolution is, is happening in Iran, right before my very eyes in the streets of Tehran. And so from that moment, this is my first moment of knowing what Iran was, where Iran was, what it means to be Iranian. And I was very confused because it seemed like they were very anti-American and I was American and all I knew was American culture. So I didn't know why they were fighting against us. I didn't know, <laughs> like they were saying, you know, I didn't know why they were saying Marg Bar Amrika. It really hurt me a lot. And I remember as a little kid thinking, why are my people hurting my people, especially when the Americans were taking hostage? So at that time, there was a lot of propaganda against Islam. Not necessarily against the Iranians, but against Islam, and especially Shia Islam. I remember as a little girl reading that Sunnis were the moderate Muslims, and that Shias were the extremists, and they wanted to foment revolution you know, wherever they went, and they were really volatile and dangerous. And so this is my first inkling of what Shiism is from the revolution, but from the perspective of the American media. From that time on, I became fascinated with the Middle East, especially with Iran. I didn't really know anything about Islam, but as time went on, as you know, I grew up, I learned more about Islam through the lens of the American media talking against Shia Islam and against Iran. So I had started to look at TV broadcasts and read newspapers and magazines from the time I was a little girl. When I was 11 years old, I knew who the politicians were you know, in Iran. And I started developing so much, I started getting so much propaganda in my head against Islam just by trying to find about my culture. And I wasn't necessarily interested in politics. I just wanted to know what Iran was and what it meant to be Iranian because I didn't know Iranians anywhere. So I grew up a typical American girl I was, you know, raised by typical Americans. They didn't know anything about Islam, and they didn't know anything about Iran either. So as I grew up, when I got to be about 11 years old, for the first time in my life, this is when I saw the shrine of Fatima Masuma in Qom. And I thought it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life. And I remember as an 11-year-old saying to myself, I want to go there one day. And I thought, I don't want to be a Muslim, because I've heard so many bad things about Islam, but I want to go to Qom, and I want to go to the shrine of Fatima Masuma. When I was 15 and 16 years old, I started hearing about Imam Hussein from the American media. But at that time, it was during the Iran-Iraq war, and they had this news program. They were showing the mothers of martyrs and Beheshte Zahra who were crying. And I believe it might have been around the time of Muharram and Ashura because I remember them talking about Imam Hussein. It was the first time I ever heard his name. They were saying that these mothers of the martyrs were comparing the time that they were living through in the Iran-Iraq war 
to the time of Hussein and Yazid. And the newscaster who was talking about it was talking about it in a disparaging way, kind of, kind of making it seem like, why are these people still crying after 1,400 years? It's such a ridiculous thing. Get over it, you know? So I had all these influences upon my mind, you know, about Islam. I definitely didn't have the right ideas. When I got into college, I took a class on Islam and we went to a mosque and it was a Sunni mosque and I remember I was hesitant to walk in. I had never been in a mosque before. I didn't know what I was going to feel. I was 21 years old and I remember stepping inside and the ceiling was covered in blue and gold Islamic art. And the feeling inside was something I'd never felt in my life. I was almost compelled to throw myself on the ground into sajda. I didn't know what that was at the time, but I felt like that's what I wanted to do. And at the time, I think it may have been about duhur prayer. And I wanted to pray. I felt compelled to pray, you know. But I, at the same time that I felt compelled to pray, all this rush of all this information that I had heard over so many years against Islam and against Muslims and all the propaganda came rushing through my head. And I said, I can't do that. I can't, I can't bow my head to, to Allah. Furthermore, you know, Islam is a sexist religion. I, I, I don't want to be any part of that. And there's all these people around here. No, I just, so I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. And from that time on, I think I just went out and just lived my life, you know. Um, and I didn't really give much thought to Islam very much or Iran. I studied a little bit about Sufism from books, but I wasn't really pursuing anything. And then 9-11 happened, and that really changed my life because whatever I knew about Islam in the Middle East never prepared me for 9-11. And I was living in New York at the time, so it was really deeply disturbing. I was actually living just a couple miles across the East River in Brooklyn from the ground zero. And I remember the debris coming down from the buildings. Like, um, I remember the debris coming down from the buildings like it was like a snowstorm, you know. And going outside, you'd get the, you'd get a rush of the uh, fumes from the smoke, you know, in your in your throat, and it was just, it was just, it was just a terrible time, terrible time in New York. So it really affected me really strongly, and I wanted to know more about Islam. At this point, we have the internet, so I can, I'm not limited by like you know what they say on ABC News or CBS or CNN. And I'm not limited by what the librarians choose to buy, you know, at the library. I can look on the internet. So I started researching about Islam, researching more. And I thought, hey, what about Shia Islam? My father must have been Shia because he was from Iran. So at that time, it was like very early, I think, in the stages of the internet, I went to, I went online and I tried to look for some Shia website, and all I found was one website, and it had the blood dripping down saying, Hussein, and it scared the heck out of me. I didn't know what it was. As an American with no exposure to Islam, I had no idea. So I said, okay, let's just put that to the side. Yeah, uh, and the website just scared me. I'm blood dripping. You know, this is my first introduction to my father's religion. Blood dripping from his name. So it was just too shocking. Um, but I started to audit some classes at my alma mater, Hunter College. I was going to school in New York at the time. And uh, I met some girls because I started taking like Muslim oriented classes, you know. And I met some Muslims for the first time in my life, and they were Wahhabi. Now I know they were Wahhabi. At the time, I, <laughs> I had no idea. And I liked them. They were nice, but they were a little strict. <laughs> and I read some of the materials that they gave me, 
and I was not interested in Islam. So it, I feel like it was a continuous process. It just didn't make any sense to me. It was so strict and just so against human nature. I just didn't like it. Um, so fast forward maybe a year or two. I get a credential to teach English as a second language and I go to Algeria. It's the first time I've ever been outside this country. Uh, I had been to Mexico, which is, you know, 30 minutes away from here, so that's like no big deal. And I had seen like, you know, the Niagara Falls in Canada, but Algeria was really the first foreign country I went to, and that was a big wake up. So it was the first Muslim country, first foreign country I had been to. And when I was there teaching English, there was just like this sweetness in the air that I felt. And the people in Algeria, you know, they weren't such practicing Muslims because they had a long history of colonialism, and colonialism had really done a damage, you know, and especially I was in the, you know, the upper middle class uh, suburbs, you know, teaching, and that's where our, our um, sorry, that's where our um, school was located, and um, in the diplomatic suburbs. And so, the people really weren't that religious. You wouldn't find anybody that would tell you that they didn't believe in God, but the people that I was around, at least, they were not really religious. If you went to downtown Algiers, you know, on Juma, you'd see, like, you know, outside the mosque, you'd see, like, rows and rows and rows of men praying. And even, you know, where I lived when it was Juma, the, the men would go religiously, faithfully, they would go to Juma, but, you know, people, people weren't really really that religious. Um, when the Azan would come, they would just, they'd be standing there talking, the Azan would come and they'd just talk faster, you know? <laughs> it's just, they wouldn't go pray or go to a mosque or anything. Uh, so despite this, I felt such an interest in Islam and I felt this sweetness in the air and I didn't know what it was and I thought, is that Islam? And I remember I had this class one day and I was talking about it. And all my students were like, yeah, yeah, that's Islam. You should become Muslim. And I was like, well, maybe. I, you know, I'm thinking about it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm studying. And uh, I started reading about the 99 names of God. And to me, that was really beautiful. And then uh, finally, I went on this bus trip to the Sahara Desert. And we went from downtown Algiers to the Sahara. The scenery on that trip it's almost like going through every state in America. You know, you, you see your Utah, you see your, your Arizona, your California, with all the flora and fauna on the desert and everything. And I remember looking out the window, and I had this intense spiritual experience where I literally saw the ayat of Allah. Because I hadn't been religious. I lost my faith when I was 10 years old because I had been bullied. I was bullied really badly. It affected me, you know, for so many years. It still affects me to this day. Uh, so I lost my faith for many years and I had studied every religion you can think of, trying to find a religion, trying to find a reason to believe in God, you know, and I couldn't because I used to pray every day, you know, to God to, to make the bullying stop, you know, I, oh, well, actually I used to pray to Jesus, Jesus make everything stop, and it never did, so I just lost my faith when I was, when I was 10. So when I was on this bus trip, I turned and I looked out the window just to see the scenery like anybody on a bus trip would do, and I literally saw the ayats of Allah, the signs of Allah, as we were going along through the countryside. And <coughs> I just, I can't even describe it. It was just such a spiritual, mystical experience for me that everything I saw was a sign of Allah that I finally had belief that I decided that I wanted to be Muslim. So I became Muslim in Algeria. Then when I came home, that's when I became Shia. That's when I started researching. I said, oh yeah, what about my father was Shia? Let me research about that. And I went to the library just looking for a Quran and I found the Najal Balaga. And when I read the words of Imam Ali, it just blew me away. I mean, you know, such a man, 
such poetry, such valor, you know. We don't even have enough attributes to describe Imam Ali. And to read his words, like, you know, a person is either your brother in faith or your equal in humanity, that's exactly how I was raised. I feel like I would, even though my parents are Christian, I feel like my mother raised me to be a Muslim because she raised me with the highest American ideals, manners, and etiquettes, which I feel is what Islam is. You know, she let me choose my own religion. And same with my brother. My brother became a Catholic, you know, I became Shia Muslim. Uh, but I really honestly feel that the highest ideals of American manners, etiquettes, and thinking is just Islamic. They, they go hand in hand, of course. That's not what we're seeing in America now. But that is, that is to me, that's the real America, and that's how I was raised. Okay. And it was absolutely spontaneous and unplanned. And I think that my mother had an inkling that I was maybe converting to Islam. But uh, we were going over to my brother's house, and he was having some workmen come over to do something at the house, fix something. And I immediately thought, oh my god, <laughs> I put on a hijab. I went into the bathroom, and I put on a hijab, and I came out, and all hell broke loose. Uh, my brother started yelling at me and telling me, like, you're an American, take that thing off. You know, and maybe there's some bad language involved. <laughs> uh, my mother, she cried her eyes out, you know, because she didn't, she didn't understand her job. She didn't like her job. She didn't want me to wear it. She didn't understand what this meant. She didn't want me to become indoctrinated. She didn't want me to become brainwashed. My whole family said, you know, okay, keep your open mind, okay? Don't become brainwashed. And I was like, oh, it's smart. I'm not going to become brainwashed. Um, I think now uh, it's been 12 years. And I think now, you know, they, they accept it more. There's still maybe, you know, some issues here and there. But, you know, for the most part, uh, I think they accept it. When I was in Algeria, I remember thinking to myself, what madhab should I be? I thought you could just like pick it, you know? <laughs> like, oh, should I be Hanafi or Maliki or Shafi'i? I thought, I guess I'll just be Maliki because I converted in Algeria, you know? And then when I came home, that's when I thought about my biological father and, and started thinking more about Shiism. And I contacted uh, some Muslims that I know and I asked them, do you know any Shia? And they just introduced me to Astila, uh, who's a lady here. And uh, she introduced me to this community here in San Diego, um, to the Iraqi and the Iranian community. And uh, through her, you know, I got to know people. But for me, it was a very disappointing experience because I remember when I was introduced to people, I don't know what I expected, but it was heartbreaking because she would pull friends, oh, come here, come, come meet Kathar, you know, she's a new convert. No, I didn't have my Islamic name back then, but I'm going to come meet her, you know, she's a new convert. I say, you know, introduce us and everything. And the response was, mashallah, sister, alhamdulillah, I got a hug, and then they walked away. And that was really difficult for me. And I feel like uh, the community here, how should I say? I still feel like a stranger after all this time because I feel like I don't have like a, a peer group, a similar you know, age peer group, or, or I don't feel like the community especially the born Muslim community has fully opened up their arms like and embraced me. Um, that's been really difficult, you know. Another thing is that in my journey of Islam five years ago, I got cancer and I had chemotherapy and after that my health just completely fell apart. And I felt like that community like really failed me and just left me all alone. And I try not to cry. <laughs> I don't really like to talk about this because 
I don't want to open myself up so much, but maybe this will help somebody else. In the time since I became Muslim, um, I've remained unmarried, not by any fault of my own. It's just that there's nobody my age in this community, and no, nobody my age are suitable. And um, I just haven't been able to, you know, find someone. And it seems to the naked eye that like, Islam is all about families and husband and wife and children. And I haven't had that. I always felt so alienated. But the other day I had a revelation. The other day I had a revelation that doesn't matter. Maybe Islam in one sense is about community and society and family. And even though I don't have any of that, one of the other main components of Islam is the individual. And the whole point, one of the whole point, the whole point of our existence is to worship God and to achieve perfection, to become an insan kamil, an insan kamala for me as a female. And that's what I've been trying to do this whole time. And so if I can just hold on to that, then I don't have to worry about anything or feel embarrassed or inferior or like, just all those, <laughs> I don't know, embarrassed, inferior, or unwanted. Because that was the shocking thing to me, was that Islam is the perfect religion, and that it would be so hard, and that I wouldn't really, I would struggle to feel that sisterhood and that, that brotherhood that we're supposed to have. Honestly, one of the first things that attracted me to the religion, and I didn't know it was attracting me to the religion, it was when I was a little girl, and I would be watching these programs about Iran and Iraq on TV, these news reports, and they would have be playing, you know, in the background there would be Latmia. And I remember hearing it, like, you know, when, when I was, like, you know, a young girl and a teenager, and it just struck me as one of the most beautiful things I'd ever heard in my life. How could somebody who sang, like Basim Karbalai say, who sang so, so honestly and so purely from his heart, how could, how could the religion be wrong? When I was first studying, you know, to see what is right, Shia or Sunni, and I wasn't just basing it on whether, you know, my father was Iranian and I want to be Iranian and I want to be Shia Muslim because it wasn't, it wasn't that at all. It was a, it was a calling in my heart that, that, that came to my heart. Um, when I was studying, I had no idea what, what the truth was. And so I just had to go based on logic. And at the time that I was converting, I shouldn't say mashallah. <laughs> it helped me to understand the history of Islam because President Bush Jr. was in power and everything that was going on at that time, I related to Karbala. And it made so much sense to me. So based on logic, based on um, you know, the beautiful music, the heartfelt poetry, which I didn't understand at all, but the, the, the rhythms and the sounds and the melodies and the honesty and the purity, you know, and the emotion, just, it, just, it just spoke to my heart. And my first Muharram, I thought it was a little strange. <laughs> and it was a culture shock uh, to see people during Matam. But then, as like time went on, my two favorite seasons of the year became Ramadan and Muharram, because these were the two seasons of the year that you know we really focused on reviving our hearts. And 
after a while, after attending so many, you know, majalis, I realized that the Matam is waking up our hearts to be a soldier for Imam Hussein and to keep Islam alive. I felt like I wanted to say, like, when I see the people at the mosque, maybe I'm too shy to ask. I may not seem shy, but I'm shy. So when I see people that I, I see at every occasion, I think, we're very friendly to each other. Why don't you invite me to your house? Why don't you invite me over for holidays? How come Eid for me is only the Eid prayer? And after it's over, I go home and cry because I don't have any relatives to come visit me, and I don't have any relatives to go visit. You know? It's we see each other here, and that's it. And then I go back to my life, and I don't know if they have their family. And <laughs>